morning, Glory America. I'm Hugh Hewitt, but I'm not there. I am on the beaches of Hawaii somewhere reading a Dickens novel with the fetching Mrs. Hewitt. The ideal vacation for a week before more madness of the Ohio primary. This week, though, sitting in for me Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Colonel Kurt Schlichter. You've read all of his novels. You've read all of his nonfiction books. You read his townhall.com column. I am pleased to say, I think I discovered Kurt. Actually, he stormed the studio and said, I will be your guest host, and we weren't going to argue with this heavily armed. No, he's not heavily armed. We love Colonel Kurt. He did trick me into going to Kosovo for the best three days I've ever spent with the troops. And he's one heck of a radio show host. Welcome, Colonel Kurt. Thank you, Hugh Hewitt. I hope you're enjoying lying on the beach in Hawaii. While I am covering down here in the Relief Factor studio in beautiful Southern California at O'Dark 30 in the morning, we have so much news and I want to get right to it. The big news. It's going to be a bloodbath on Wall Street today, folks. I'm sitting here looking at the Dow futures. The Dow futures are already down nearly 5%, down 1,255 points. A lot of this relates to the coronavirus. Some of it relates to some antics in the oil market. Looks like... um, Saudi Arabia and Russia couldn't agree on production cuts, so Saudi Arabia says we're just going to cut. Down 30%. The price of crude oil, down 30%. Can you believe it? And, of course, this is packing the market, but think about it. Is it really that bad that oil's that cheap? Is it really a kind of stimulus And one that we can use right now as people are going nuts about the coronavirus. And there's some other things going on, too. Um, We've got uh, uh, the fight between Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden. We will be talking a lot about that today. But but what's on everybody's mind and in far too many people's lungs is the coronavirus. Uh, The cases are increasing in number, but we're getting some more information here. One of the things that... uh, uh, they finally explained to us is who, who is at risk. Were you aware that around the world, no one under 30 has died from the coronavirus that they know of? Very few people under 50. Uh, primarily the people that we're losing are over 80. So if you are elderly and if you have a condition like heart disease or maybe you're on dialysis or something like that, yeah, yeah maybe you need to take extra special precautions. The rest of us should just use common sense. I tried to use common sense when I was in that seething Petri dish of infective agents known as CPAC. Yes, the Conservative Political Action Conference. Here is, I'm going I'm to share with you my coronavirus story. Uh, we found out this weekend, I open up my email, and there's a thing from the American Conservative Union, Matt Schlapp, heading it. And it says, um... Yeah, there was a guy here, and he was from New Jersey, which didn't surprise me, and he had coronavirus. But everybody's cool, and he didn't meet the president. Turns out he did meet Matt Schlapp. Now, now, when I was at CPAC, I was asked by the powers that be at Salem to sit in for Mike Gallagher on his show. And um, I, I, I readily agreed. And one of the people I interviewed with, one of the people I was face-to-face with there at CPAC for about 15 minutes was, yes, Matt Schlapp. So, have I personally been exposed to coronavirus? I don't know. But I'm not scared. I'm not worried. I'm not freaking out. I was, uh, you know, CPAC, you always get some horrible illness at CPAC. The last time I was at CPAC, a couple years ago... Ended up uh, hanging out with my friend Derek Hunter afterwards. Gave his poor kid the flu. I was sick as a dog. It's no fun having the flu. And you know, so I was I was there. I'm, I'm, I'm gobbling Zycam. I'm washing my hands left and right. Everybody was doing that. See, here's the thing. All this panicking, all these precautions that we're taking, they're, they're going to have an effect. They're actually going to slow down the spread of this obnoxious disease. And coupled with the fact we're coming out of flu season, we're getting into spring, weather's going to warm up, you'll have the sun out there disinfecting things. I think we're kind of, while the numbers are going up, I, I, I think it's like a ballistic missile. It's only powered in the first phase, then it kind of glides, and then the parabola, you know, shifts and it starts going down, 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 down. You know, I 
I, I know that people give the president a lot of grief because they really want this to be a disaster. They want it to be his Katrina. And when he says it's under control, you know, it, it kind of is. If you look at the people he's out there, he's got Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is a an amazing epidemiologist. He's been, out, been around for a long, long time. Uh, he's on all sorts of TV shows. He was on 60 Minutes yesterday. Of course, they ask him, uh, uh, Dr. Fauci, was... Uh, is the president attempting to uh, silence you? And he's like, well, I, let him say it himself. Cut number 14. I think a lot of people are very interested in the relationship between the scientists and the administration. Right. And specifically, if President Trump says something like, at the beginning of February, like, we think we have it under control, you're in the room. Were you able to I push talk? back? Of course. Some people have been worried that you've been muzzled. I'm not muzzled because I'm talking to exactly. you. Exactly. You're right, right here. You, okay. He, he's literally on 60 Minutes talking about it. President's been getting people out there uh, following the advice of, of Hugh Hewitt. Now, it, what's interesting is Hugh Hewitt was at the vanguard of the coronavirus story. I, I listened every day, as you should listen every day. Uh, I'm part of the universe, and you should become a member. And by the way, if you are a member, you can uh, also get my unredact or my uh, podcast, Fighting Words, which is available on there. I do that once a week. Talk about something a little more serious than uh, maybe some of my other stuff. In any case, uh, I listen to Hugh every week, and Hugh is where I found out about coronavirus. Hugh was talking about this long before anybody else was. So. Here on the Hugh Hewitt Show, you're always getting the straight news. You're getting it fast. You're getting it before everybody else. You are ahead of the power curve. But I think the power curve for the virus itself, I think I, I think it's going down. Uh, another interesting news flash out of China. One of the emergency hospitals they set up, remember, because they were getting overflown, was, uh, was closed. I think we're going to see more cases, unfortunately more deaths, but I think in the coming weeks it's going to it's going to start subsiding. And I think by the time the election rolls around, uh, Operation Blame Trump for the Virus is going to have been proven to be yet another failure. If you maybe maybe you saw the tweet this morning between uh, Andrew Cuomo, governor, governor of New York, and Donald Trump. Uh, Cuomo, we're, we're, we're getting mixed messages out of Washington. How the federal government, it, mixed messages. And Trump was like, you know, the only mixed message is you guys trying to weaponize this virus. And, of course, he called Andrew Cuomo's brother uh, Chris Fredo, which amuses me no end. I have a question for the people who are unhappy with Donald Trump's handling of the virus what exactly should trump be doing that he's not doing i mean what why well, should be showing leadership that's not a tangible act that is a tactic what should donald trump be doing should he be barring all travel from China? Well, I, I mean, the virus is here. Virus is always going to be here. Should he be doing that? Should he bar domestic travel? I think that's kind of an overreaction. What should Donald Trump Trump be doing that he is not doing right now? And and you don't get an answer. You get these kind of things. He's just handling this terribly. Well, in what way? In what way is he handling this terribly? Well, he's saying it's under control. W would you prefer he demand panic? Everybody, run around in the streets. Wave your hands over your head. What should Donald Trump be doing that he's not doing? The simple fact is Donald Trump has managed to oversee a response that's it, 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 both competent and measured. Well, there aren't enough test kits. Well, I, you know, when Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton... He was not issued a magic wand to create test kits. None of this is reasonable. And I, I, and I submit to you, it's not politically smart. I, mean, I get what they want to do. Nothing has taken down Trump. Not emoluments. Not Russians. Not mean tweets. 
nothing takes down Trump. Coronavirus is not going to take down Trump either. Because we're going to get through it. And the stock market's going to go back up, even though people are panicking. By the way, I put money in on Friday. So I put my money is where my mouth is. And you should stay where you are right here on the Hugh Hewitt Show. This is guest host Kurt Schlichter. I'll be right back. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by I Still Believe. Rated PG. Parental guidance suggested.
because we cannot get reelect. We cannot win this reelection. Excuse me. We can only reelect Donald Trump. <laughs> Yes, hey, look, take it from Joe Biden. Let's reelect President Donald Trump. This is Kurt Schlichter sitting in for the great Hugh Hewitt, who is taking a well-deserved vacation somewhere in the Hawaiian Islands as we speak, while I toil here in the Relief Factor studio at O-Dark 30 somewhere in Southern California. Look, let's get serious for a second. I want to remind you about Hughes' spring campaign to help rush food and clean drinking water to starving kids in Guatemala through our friends at Food for the Poor. And let me add a personal note. I, I give money to Food for the Poor. I write a check. I'm a Los Angeles trial lawyer, and I write a check. There's no greater endorsement. And it's because less than half of all the kids in rural Guatemala have access to clean, safe drinking water, and most of them go hungry on a daily basis. We can't let that happen. The thing is, they're warm and welcoming to visitors, as high school, Nashville High School junior Natalie Anderson found out on a recent mission with Food for the Poor. I was actually pretty nervous. I might not be able to connect with the children because of the language barrier. But the second family we met, I just fell in love with this little girl named Camila. She placed two of her very own stickers on my hands. And it just struck me because even in her own despair and desperation and not having anything at all, she was still giving something to me. I just feel like we can take something from that and even in our abundance. If she can give her two little stickers to me, we can give back to their community. As Natalie says, we can give back. And like I said, I do myself. Why don't you? Please, right now, just this second, Take a moment, unless you're in a car, don't do it in the car, but go to HughHewitt.com. There's a banner right up at the top, or call 855-359-4673. That's 855-359-HOPE. $80 will provide a hungry child with food for a year and water for life. Thank you very much for helping us feed starving families through our friends at Food for the Poor. And I also want to let you know, from the creators of I Can Only Imagine, Based on an inspiring new, true story, I Still Believe, the movie. It's coming out. It stars K.J. Apa, Britt Robertson, Shania Twain, and this show's good friend Gary Sinise. It's Red PG, Parental Guidance Suggested. It's in theaters March 13th. Check it out. And check out these numbers, man. The uh, futures, yeah, the futures look ugly. It's down, what, 4.87% on coronavirus fears and questions about oil and the price war that we're going to see. Now, the thing is, here's my bet. And once again, put my money where my mouth is. I, I went back into the stock market with some cash on Friday. Bought a couple of stocks that I uh, think are going to go up. Uh, I think they were bargains. Look, we're, we're in a panic moment right now. We got a lot of people who are very, very scared. And a lot of people want to get out of the market. I, I think the fundamentals are strong. I think looking at those job numbers last week that surprised everybody, America's hiring. It's not firing. I think we're going to do just fine. I think we're, we, we, look, it's going to get worse before it gets better, but it's going to get better. And this oil thing, this, the you know, si since when did, uh, since when did oil prices coming down become a terrible thing? Now, it is terrible for some of our people in the energy sector. Look, it's, it's going to be hard on people in Texas, it's going to be hard on some people in Pennsylvania for a bit. But it's good for the economy as a whole. It's good for the economy as a whole, as a whole because it's like a tax cut. When, you're, when oil prices go down, the price of everything goes down. I think uh, I, I think the president's right. I think we're going to be just fine. And and Joe Biden agrees. Joe Biden has a recommendation. Number nine. Because we cannot get reelect, we cannot win this reelection. Excuse me. We can only reelect Donald Trump. <laughs> Listen to Joe Biden and keep listening to the Hugh Hewitt radio program. This is guest host Kurt Schlichter. We'll be right back with Mike Allen of Axios.
This portion of the Hugh Hewitt Show has been brought to you by MyPillow. Call 800-951-5493 or go to MyPillow.com and be sure to use a promo code Hugh.
because we cannot get reelect. We cannot win this reelection. Excuse me. We can only reelect Donald Trump. We're back, back on the Hugh Hewitt radio program. This is Kurt Schlichter sitting in for Hugh while he's on vacation. Who am I? I'm a senior columnist for townhall.com. I'm a noted Los Angeles trial lawyer. I'm a retired United States Army colonel. And I am honored to bring you once again one of this show's greatest guests. Always amusing, always insightful. Mike Allen, Axios.com co-founder. How you doing, Mike? Uh, good morning, and uh, I hope you had a good time springing ahead. <laughs> I'm uh, I, I'm dragging. I'm 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 slow. I, uh, I I I'm I'm logy, um, but I'm also excited. I'm excited because you guys on Axios have a major scoop about what could be the greatest cage match in American history: Don Jr. versus Hunter Biden. Are you going to make this happen? Yeah. So on Axios. On HBO this week, we go to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, Jim Vanda High, Axios. CEO goes to a dive bar of his youth. Uh, Jim grew up in Oshkosh, went back, uh, met some of the uh, local local people, and had a great interview with uh, Don Jr., now up on all, uh, on all HBO platforms. And as part of that, he asked Don Jr. Uh, how big a role... Hunter Biden would play in the coming campaign, and Don Jr. said, "Well, he needs to do. He needs to play a big role." And Don said, "You know what? I'll do a debate. We'll do a debate over who has profited more from having their father in office." And you moderate. Wow, I, I, I look. I would pay money to to see it. Would, would, would you guys at Axios consider doing a pay per view of Don Jr. versus Hunter Biden, the 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 clash of the titans, if you will? No, that's, uh, that's right. And uh, then Jim asked Hunter Biden if he uh, asked Don Jr. if he would release his tax returns, and Don Jr. said, "100 percent, as long as it goes." Uh, both ways, uh, I'm happy to. He says, let's talk about who profited off whose public service. Happy to do it. Let's make it happen. The Biden campaign tells us it's hard to believe anything that Trump says on tax returns when Donald Sr. has lied for years about releasing his. Well, they, they, the, the, the Biden campaign seems uh, uh, pretty frisky about Hunter Biden. I look at this guy with all his problems. Everything from drugs to getting booed out of the Navy to, uh, uh, you know, his own little stripper thing. And I'm, I'm thinking this guy's an anchor around Joe Biden's neck. How can, it, you know, are they taking this seriously? Well, one thing that uh, they're doing, uh, it's possible that Joe Biden runs the tables uh, starting tomorrow. So tomorrow's Michigan, Bernie Sanders have been expected to win it uh, starting the day after Super Tuesday. Uh, top of the front page of the Detroit News polls showing Biden ahead. Joe Biden, surprisingly, as you saw just in the last couple of days, the AP confirming based on their delegate count that Joe Biden came out of Super Tuesday with more delegates than Bernie Sanders. And whatever happens Tuesday night, if you look at the math, after Michigan, Joe Biden is still going to have uh, more. So uh, uh, looking and feeling very strong and astonishing turnaround. You know, Mike Allen of Axios, I, I know you're a, a straight-up reporter. You don't take sides. But let me ask you, what? how do the Democrats feel about having a guy like Joe Biden? And I got to tell you, he's a, he's a step behind. Uh, Dwayne, can we play the thing? Oh, here we come. We know these should be self-evident. All men and women created by... The Go, you know the you know the thing. Look, uh, uh, objectively, Mike Allen, Joe Biden's he's old and he's he, he he's in decline. Do the how do the Democrats feel about having a candidate who's constantly generating gaffes, which uh, my side is making hay of? Here's the flip side of that, and that is that he would bring experience. Axios is up with a column 
this morning, Jim Vanda High and I have a column behind the curtain where we look inside how Joe Biden would govern. And as we talk to people close to the vice president, what we find is we're calling the return to normal plan, a a reversal of the unorthodox improvisational style we have now, going back to known trusted people from the Obama years. So some of the names uh, that came up in these conversations with people in the vice president's circle of trust. John Kerry would love to take a cabinet position devoted to climate change. You saw him uh, out there traveling in Iowa for Joe Biden. Susan Rice, of course, uh, President uh, Obama's national security advisor, maybe for state. Mike Bloomberg might come in. What's a job that Mike Bloomberg would take? Heading the World Bank. Sally Yates, remember her? Uh, for Deputy Attorney General under Obama? Uh, back as Attorney General. And here's a big question. Could he, Joe Biden get back some of the scar tissue that, that get past some of the scar tissue there is from the Obama administration and bring in Elizabeth Warren as Treasury Secretary? What a statement that would make. Yeah, it would be a statement that he's completely tone deaf about anything outside the Beltway. Now, I I understand that you guys report on what our establishment is saying, and I can fully imagine it's some Georgetown uh, 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 cocktail party, uh, a bunch of people going, "Yeah, it'd be great getting uh, John Kerry back in the mix." I mean, I hear I hear he's good friends with the Iranians, and uh, you know he can do uh, you know he can uh, cater to the uh, fanatics of the weather cult. Uh, But outside, you know, in America, we've got unemployment that's at rock bottom. Uh, The job numbers are incredible. We're not involved in any more uh, failing wars, and we're getting out of the ones we're in. And we've gotten out of the ridiculous uh, 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 climate change uh, accords and a whole bunch of other nonsense. I mean, the idea that Americans are seeking to go back to the problems we had in the Obama year, I, I just don't see that as realistic. So uh, while we're talking about how great things are in America, as you know, Hugh was very big very early on the coronavirus. What's yes, your latest take about on the uh, coronavirus? What's your take on where we are, how that's being handled? What's your outlook for it? I think that we have uh, uh, we are still in an upward trajectory, but it's going to turn down. I think the things that uh, we're upward, traje- upward trajectory in numbers of cases, num- numbers of deaths, n- numbers of cases, and uh, unfortunately numbers of deaths. Though we have some interesting information uh, that there have been no deaths under the age of thirty, very few under fifty. Most of the people who really, really uh, uh, suffer and and are hospitalized are over sixty or over eighty. So we're, we're learning more about the virus, and I think the, the president's uh, administration is doing a good job of getting information out. It had Anthony Fauci on uh, 60 Minutes last night. He's a guy everybody uh, agrees is the right man for the job. How do you, Mike Allen, how do you feel about the perception of how the administration's doing politically? Well, this is a real risk uh, to them, and one of the best pieces it's been written about this uh, during the whole crisis. It's been by uh, Brian Walsh, Brian Walsh of Axios, who writes our future newsletter. He talks about how the coronavirus experience could change so much about the economy and the country. So uh, think about what could change. Uh, working remotely could become very much more normal, and. Uh, uh, it's events like this that can reshape the economy for a decade. And so uh, pull back, look at the big picture. This is a transformative event. Do you, uh, Mike, Ax- uh, Mike, Al- uh, Mike Allen of Axios, do you think that this is also highlighting some of our vulnerabilities? For instance, I didn't realize uh, that the vast majority of our antibiotics are now made in China. And that's a, that's a vulnerability that this has made clear what what kind of uh changes do you see coming down the road uh as far as bringing production back to the united states no that's a very uh good uh point we did not i think people didn't focus on how much the supply chains are intertwined that's another point that brian walsh makes in this article he calls it the big decoupling and if you think about it after travel the companies that have suffered most so far from the virus are those that have 
just-in-time supply chains that depend on China. So there's a lot of tech uh, companies. And so if you can, if this worsens, we can imagine an accelerated decoupling of manufacturing uh, from China. Ian Bremer, president of Eurasia Group, tells us changes that may have been delayed until the next recession will happen right now. Well, we're looking at uh, pretty pretty bad uh, Dow futures, uh, down about 1,255 points last time I checked. Uh, we're also looking at a shock to the oil market as Saudi Arabia and Russia are unable to come uh, to an agreement. How do you feel the economic turbulence is going to affect the election in the short term? Yeah, for sure. This undercuts one of the president's biggest arguments you were talking about. The economic picture, so promising. Like, all this could change in a hurry. And a good point that uh, Amy Harder, our energy columnist, made is that this was foreseeable. People uh, talk about black swans as events uh, that come out of the blue that you can't foresee. Like another uh, term uh, that was new to me is gray rhinos. And gray rhinos are events that are foreseeable but are not foreseen, <laughs> that you could focus on but you're not. And the possibility of a pandemic is something that Bill Gates and others have warned of for a long time. And you're right, like I join you, and we're learning a lot about it, these risks, vulnerabilities, effects. This was knowable. There people were people who did know it, but it wasn't focused on. And we could pay a big price for that. Uh, we have less than a minute left, Mike Allen of Axios. What do you think the ultimate fallout of coronavirus will be uh, regarding President Trump's re-election? Oh, we can't look ahead to the re-election. I think at the, this moment, when our neighbors here at Christchurch in Georgetown, uh, their services canceled yesterday, their rector uh, hospitalized, uh, someone who has uh, the first person in D.C. to get it. Uh, it. Right now, we're still on the human consequences. Politics will come. Thank you, Mike Allen of Axios. This is Kurt Schlichter standing here substituting for the great Hugh Hewitt. Stick around. Thank you, Kurt Schlichter. Even when I go on vacation, I'm in Hawaii, I'm in the wonderful island state, and I've got my relief factor with me. I want to assure you that wherever you are, whether you're in Rhode Island or on Kauai, you ought to be taking relieffactor.com. Whether you're running a marathon or going up and down the steps, whatever it is you need, I carry in curcumin, resveratrol, and omega, the four supplements that make life easier to get through. If you're on vacation or if you're in the hardest day of work you've ever had, relieffactor.com isn't a one day, a one week, or a one month decision. It's a lifetime commitment to better health. And the folks at relieffactor.com give you a three-week trial pack at $19.95 to make it so. Support the temporary relief of the minor aches and pains that plague ordinary living. Don't forget your Relief Factor. Turn around, go back in the house and get it. It's worth the five minutes to turn the car around, go back and get your relieffactor.com. It doesn't work if you don't take it and you can't take it if you don't get the starter pack. $19.95 at relieffactor.com. I hope Kurt Schlichter takes it. I hope you take it. And whatever you do, come right back for more of Kurt Schlichter filling in here on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Don't forget to sign up for The Universe. All of Hugh's broadcasts on demand, The After Show, which in my opinion is worth the price all by itself, Dwayne FM, and all sorts of bonus content. www.huniverse.com
because we cannot get reelect. We cannot win this reelection. Excuse me. We can only reelect Donald Trump. This is the Hugh Hewitt radio program. I'm guest host Kurt Schlichter, senior columnist at Town Hall, retired United States Army colonel, noted trial lawyer and descendant from the strong willed people of Western Pennsylvania. And no one is stronger willed. And our friend Selena Zito. Hi, Selena. Good morning, Sunshine. How are you? I'm doing great. Great to have you. There's nobody I'd rather talk to today than you and ask you this question. Yeah. Are normal you, you you've got your finger on the pulse of normal America. What do they think of putting up a guy as the Democrat nominee who says things like this? Because we cannot get reelected. We cannot win this re-election. Excuse me, we can only re-elect Donald Trump. Uh, Selena, what? Huh? Uh, I think... I think that Democrats... <laughs> uh, I actually feel really bad for them. Because, you know, they they wanted so bad to to um, put someone, nominate someone that could beat Donald Trump and be electable, right? I mean, that, that is what they have been talking about since uh, November uh, what, 10th of 2016. And they went through this sort of painful, awkward nominating process with all of these uh, people that were vying for the position. Uh, none of them sort of being that person, right? Democrats always like to fall in love. And um, um, does anyone love director, does anyone love Joe Biden or did they just sort of tolerate him like the crazy uncle who always threatens to ruin Thanksgiving? I think that people genuinely like Joe Biden, the Democrats. Um, I, I would say not the Bernie supporters, but I think they like him. Um, and respect his his career, but I, I don't think they're in love. Uh, and I think what they're doing is they're doing what Republicans do, which is fall in line. And um, uh, and 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 this this is who their candidate is. And and gosh darn it, they're gonna you know maybe stand behind him. I don't know. It's not. It's it's it's, it's this is not the. The guy or the gal, you're like, I can't wait to vote for them. I can't wait. I can't wait to show up. I mean, you know, that's what you want for your nominee, and that's not what they got. Look, Joe Biden is. I mean, let, let, let's be honest here. He's in decline. We we heard the little cut. There's plenty more. There's the one where he essentially said, "Vote for Donald Trump." The guy is in decline. He's old. He looks old. He's not sharp. He, he, look, he was never super sharp, and he's not sharp today. How's that going to play among normal Americans? Well, I mean, it's going to be a challenge. You know, I had a conversation uh, yesterday with a couple of Democrats who suggested their best sort of option with him is to run him like William McKinley, right? <laughs> We ran the, the front door or the back door uh, uh, election and, and, and never went out there and, and talked to people. And, and they think maybe that's the best thing to do. Just like, don't let them out there. Don't let them debate. You know, and, which, of course, you can't do in a modern society. So, you know, they're going to have a painful process. And you want someone to inspire you to come out. You want someone to make you want to vote for them. And that's their challenge right now. They don't have that with, with Biden. The guy who was inspiring people, and look, I, I've got no use for this communist. I've got no use for a guy who adheres to an ideology that butchered 100 million people. But the fact is, Sanders inspires people. Now, they may be dumb and immature people, but he inspires them. No, Joe Biden doesn't inspire anybody. And you're, the, the Democrats are going to have a huge block of voters who feel that, r rightly or wrongly, their voice has been silenced by the establishment. You think they stay home? I think there's going to be um, a, 
Um, well, I mean, it's you have to be seen if it'll be a significant um, amount. But there's going to be an amount in an election that's going to be, you know, in a country that's divided in half. When you have um, the potential for voters not showing up because their guy or their gal did not get in, that's going to be a problem. I mean, I think there's a lot of the Democrats have a woman problem as well because of just how poorly um, a lot of people have expressed how they feel about Elizabeth Warren no longer being in the um, race as well. I think there's a chance that there is a suppressed vote based on being unhappy with the nominee that could impact the, um, the, the Democrats' chances for winning this well, year. Well, Selena Zito, we can only hope. This is Kurt Schlichter, guest hosting for the great Hugh Hewitt. Stick around next hour. More coming up. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you by Food for the Poor.
Morning Glory, America. I'm your Hewitt, but I'm not there. I am on the beaches of Hawaii somewhere reading a Dickens novel with the fetching Mrs. Hewitt. The ideal vacation for a week before more madness of the Ohio primary. This week, though, sitting in for me Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Colonel Kurt Schlater. You've read all of his novels. You've read all of his nonfiction books. You read his townall.com column. I am pleased to say, I think I discovered Kurt. Actually, he stormed the studio and said, I will be your guest host, and we weren't going to argue with this heavily armed. No, not heavily armed. We love Colonel Kurt. He did trick me into going to Kosovo for the best three days I've ever spent with the troops. And he's one heck of a radio show host. Welcome, Colonel Kurt. Thank you, Hugh Hewitt. This is Kurt Schlichter sitting in in the Relief Factor studio in beautiful Southern California at, oh, dark 30 Western time, Pacific time, whatever you call it time, California time. California, set your clocks back 50 years because this is a failed state. We've got news. We've got a lot of news today, and the big one is, fasten your seatbelts, it's going to be a bumpy ride for your 401ks. The stock futures are down over 1,200 points. It is going to be a bloodbath on paper on Wall Street. Now, I happen to think that this combination of coronavirus panic and the shock from... uh, the Saudis and the Russians being unable to come to an agreement on oil production, and the Saudis essentially saying, great, we're just going to produce a whole ton of it, plus Chinese lack of demand, uh, that that's going to send oil prices down. It's not that a bad thing. You know, it, it's going to hurt some American oil producers. That's true. But really think of it as a giant tax cut. If your gas is cheaper, if everybody's gas is cheaper, well, that, that kind of means everything that moves with gas is cheaper. Right now, people are scared. People are worried. People are getting out of the market. And today is going to be ugly. You, you need to remain calm. I'm remaining calm. I, I, went, I went back into the market on Friday. Wish I'd waited one day. Uh, but no, I, I, I found some stocks that I thought were uh, some good deals, and I bought them, and I regret nothing. And I think when we come out of this, and we are going to come out of this, <laughs> I'm going to do very well. You can too. But uh, hey, don't take stock tips from me. You can take you know, legal advice from me. You can read my columns at Town Hall every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Don't take stock tips from me. But, you know, my analysis of the coronavirus issue I think we're I think we are on an upward trajectory and then we're going to come down. And I think it's going to get worse for the next couple of weeks. And I think the liberal media is going to be very excited about that because they would like to blame this disease, not on Chinese people eating weird things like bat soup and munching on pangolins. But on Donald Trump, because reasons and because. They're going to be disappointed. They're going to be disappointed again. The Russians couldn't take them out. The emoluments couldn't take them out. Coronavirus is not going to take them out. We are going to get by this. In fact, we're now learning more about it. And we're getting some good information, particularly from our United States Surgeon General. He was on, uh, it's uh, Jerome Adams. He was on Face the Nation with Margaret Bennon this week, and he's got some interesting insights. Uh, Cut number six, please. We've got new data emerging. We know that the average age of people who are dying from coronavirus is 80 plus. We know that the average age of people who are needing medical care and advanced medical care is 60 plus. And so what we're telling folks is that if you're in an at-risk group, meaning you're elderly and or you have comorbidities, heart disease, lung disease, you're immunosuppressed for whatever reason, that you should be taking extra precautions not to put yourself in a situation where you may be exposed. What if you're pregnant? Uh, again, that if you're pregnant, I would advise taking extra precautions. But that said, no one under the age of 30 has died of the coronavirus in uh, in South Korea. No one under the age of 50 has died of coronavirus in Japan. There's something about being younger that is protective. But if you are in one of those higher risk groups, we suggest you avoid crowded spaces. We suggest you avoid uh, potentially going on a cruise or taking a long haul flight because uh, most people are going to be fine. But we want those folks who we know are at higher risk for complications to uh, protect themselves. And protect yourselves, you should. Look, when I was at CPAC, which we just discovered had a guy with coronavirus, somebody from New Jersey, 
not a bit surprised. Um, boy, I was washing my I had I I was carrying around those little bottles of disinfectant because every time I go to CPAC, I end up with the flu. Well, it's been about eight days. I don't seem to have coronavirus yet, even though there was somebody with it hanging around. Look. Panic is bad. Precautions are good. And the simple fact that people are starting to take precautions, that people are, you know, washing their hands, disinfecting, coughing in their uh, on their sleeve, not in people's faces, uh, th- these are going to pay off. And these are going to pay off in the near future. And we're, we're going to keep seeing the number of cases rise. The cases are, uh, the numbers are going to rise. Unfortunately, deaths are too. But they're going to start going down. They start going down as we get out of flu season, as it gets warmer, as people spend more time outside. It's going to go down. And if you put all your chips on Donald Trump's uh, reaction to the coronavirus has been terrible, I think you're going to have a problem. Because, in fact, it hasn't been terrible. Can we have cut number 14, Dr. Anthony Fauci, talking on 60 Minutes? I think a lot of people are very interested in the relationship between the scientists and the administration. And specifically, if President Trump says something at the beginning of February, like, we think we have it under control, you're in the room. Were you able to I push back, of course. Some people have been worried that you've been muzzled. I'm not muzzled because I'm talking to you. Exactly. You're right right here. Okay. Dr. Anthony Fauci has not been muzzled. They're being open. They're being transparent. They're doing basically what uh, Hugh Hewitt recommended that they do. Hugh Hewitt was way ahead of the power curve on the coronavirus. He picked it up in January. That's where I heard from, uh, heard about it for the first time, right here on the Hugh Hewitt Show. I, I am a listener. I'm a member of the universe, and you should be too, where you can also get my weekly podcast, Fighting Words. So... You know, you want to check that out. But in any case, Hugh was ahead of the power curve. Now the whole media has gotten involved and they and they're looking for drama and they're looking for a villain and they're looking to pump up Joe Biden and Joe Biden. Well, Joe Biden's Joe Biden. Cut number nine, please. Because we cannot get reelect. We cannot win this reelection. Excuse me. We can only reelect Donald Trump. Finally, he says something we agree with. Well, yeah, already. You know, Dwayne, how sad do you have to be if you, you know, if you're in a party nominating a guy like Joe Biden and you've got to have a flu virus drag him across the finish line? <laughs> Play the cut again. He was in St. Louis, right? And it's, a ra- it's his rally. These are his supporters. Listen to the crowd as he's reading his speech. Hey, has this been doctored? Because no. we cannot get reelect. We cannot win this reelection. Excuse me. We can only reelect Donald Trump. Do you think that there are millions of Americans who want to spend four years with Grandpa Simpson in the White House, Dwayne? You see, that's the thing. Is is. Everybody deep down knows. Everybody knows. We all know. It's not a secret. That Joe Biden is not up to this task. He is not up to running for president. It's sad. They're, they're like the ca- dog that caught the car, right? They have this threat from this crusty communist curmudgeon and uh, all his wide-eyed college student idiot uh, supporters. And... They're thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to get this, we're going to get wiped out in November because they would. You know, uh, Sanders is Vermontese for uh, McGovern. And they're like, well, wait, wait, we got to get the moderate. We got to get Joe Biden. And then they get Joe Biden, and suddenly they have to deal with the fact that they have gotten Joe Biden. Right. They, they, they got what they wanted, and now that they got what have they wanted, they? Have do they? they really want what they got? And, you know, Mike Allen. Uh, of Axios was on the first hour, and he he said something real interesting. He said, "Look, you know, we have a uh, uh, you know an article in Axios, and you guys should be checking out Axios um, because you know they've got their finger on the pulse of what's going on in Washington. You got to know your opponent, right? Well, they're they're talking about basically uh, 
the Obama administration number two. Hey, we're going to get John Kerry in. We'll give a job to Mike Bloomberg, Susan Rice. And I'm thinking, who outside the Beltway is going, oh, yeah, right. That sounds great. Oh, I can't wait to get Ben Rose back in D.C. John Kerry. Oh, man. You know, the the kept ketchup man. (laughs) All right. Okay, we've got a lot more coming up here on the Hugh Hewitt Radio Program. I am guest host Kurt Schlichter. Stick around. We'll be right back. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by I Still Believe. Rated PG. Parental guidance suggested.
because we cannot get reelect. We cannot win this reelection. Excuse me. We can only reelect Donald Trump. Thank you, Joe Biden, for that ringing endorsement of the reelection of President Donald J. Trump. This is Kurt Schlichter sitting in for the great Hugh Hewitt at the Relief Factor Studio in beautiful Southern California at O oh, Dark 30. And news is breaking just out. The Detroit Free Press poll. Biden holds a huge 24 point edge over Sanders in Michigan. Take it with a grain of salt, though. Hillary had a 25-point lead over Sanders in Michigan last time. Sanders ended up winning Michigan's primary by 1.4%. So, you know, could, could Bernie have another miracle? He better, because if he doesn't, well, it could be a bad thing. Cut number eight. It is. I do think his, his campaign has two weeks to live mm. yeah. or prove that it's viable in the next two weeks. Michigan and Ohio being, to me, the two biggest tests he's got. Uh, right. That's Chuck Todd, friend of the show, giving Bernie about a fortnight to show that he's not a complete loser. But again, as of yesterday, there really wasn't much polling out of no, Michigan, No, no, right? there was almost. I think Nate Silver was on Twitter complaining about that. And then we get this thing. 24 points. Point. That's if a lot Bernie, of points. If Bernie loses Michigan anywhere north of 20 points, that's a, that's. I don't think he gets a fortnight. I yeah I I think I don't think he'll walk though because he's got people like AOC behind him. Uh, let's cut one. Michigan, we have Goliaths in our country today. The Goliath of the fossil fuel industry, the Goliath of big pharma, the Goliath of the role of big money in politics. Yeah, I hate those guys who've made our life good and have saved our life. I hate them so much. That's Bernie Sanders. Here, here's the problem with the Bernie Sanders people. They are not bright. They're just not. They, they, they socialism. Who's the guy who still thinks socialism is a good idea? Well, Bernie Sanders and his followers. Now, the Democrat Party understands, the establishment understands that Bernie Sanders is a disaster. That normal Americans are going to look at this crusty commie curmudgeon and say, oh, heck no. Actually, they might not say heck, but I'm trying to remain FCC compliant. He would, he would make Walter Mondale... Look like LBJ over Goldwater. He'd just get trounced. So, of course, the establishment says we need Joe Biden. And they like Joe Biden because he's, frankly, completely out of it and would be a wonderful puppet for the establishment of the Democrat Party. He would do what they say. They, they'd run the country. He'd be out in the Rose Garden chasing, uh, chasing that uppity squirrel who keeps uh, looking at him through the window. The, now, if you're a Bernie Sanders supporter, how you feeling right now? You feeling good? You feeling respected? Because I got to tell you, you've been broken and humiliated. You have been betrayed. You've been lied to. The establishment has made sure that the fix is in. Your voice has been silenced. Not by Donald Trump, though you're told Donald Trump's the cause of all your problems. But by your own party. And what are you going to do about What are you going to do about it? Are you, are you just going to take it? Are you going to let the establishment, the corporate Democrat Party, because, you know, the, the idea of Republicans is the party of big business. Come on. Come on. All these Fortune 500 guys, they all adopt the politics of their second wife. They're all Democrats. And you. You are going to obey the corporate party. That's what you're going to do. Bernie Sanders is going to have this election stolen from him again. And you're going to cry and whine. And then you're going to obey. Exactly. You are going to do what you're commanded because you're not smart because you support a socialist and you're weak and cowardly. I mean, that's just, I, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not trying to call names. I'm just calling it like it is. You're going to be abused, and then you're going to come back for more. You're going to do exactly what the people who abuse you say. It's, it's frankly pathetic. I'm embarrassed for you. 
but I'm also proud. I'm proud to be here guest hosting for the great Hugh Hewitt on the Hugh Hewitt radio program. Stick around. We'll be right back. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt show are brought to you by Food for the Poor.
because we cannot get reelect. We cannot win this reelection. Excuse me. We can only reelect Donald Trump. Listen to Joe Biden. He's the voice of experience, folks. And I'm the voice of the Hugh Hewitt radio program. At least uh, for the next three days. This is Kurt Schlichter, senior columnist at Town Hall. Noted trial lawyer, retired United States Army colonel, sitting in for the great Hugh Hewitt while he is off in Hawaii doing stuff. But he's still doing good. Let me remind you about Hugh's spring campaign to help rush food and clean drinking water to starving kids in Guatemala through our friends at Food for the Poor. Less than half of all kids in rural Guatemala have access to clean, safe drinking water, and most of them go hungry on a daily basis. But they are warm and welcoming to visitors, as Nashville High School junior Natalie Anderson found out on a recent mission with Food for the Poor. I was actually pretty nervous. I might not be able to connect with the children because of the language barrier. But the second family we met, I just fell in love with this little girl named Camila. She placed two of her very own stickers on my hands. And it just struck me because even in her own despair and desperation and not having anything at all, she was still giving something to me. I just feel like we can take something from that and even in our abundance. If she can give her two little stickers to me, we can give back to their community. As Natalie says, we can give back. Please, right now, just go to HughHewitt.com or call 855-359-4673. That's 855-359-HOPE. $80 provides a hungry child with food for a year and water for life. Thank you very much for helping us feed starving families through our friends at Food for the Poor. Hey, the President of the United States... The fake news media and their partner, the Democrat Party, is doing everything within its semi-considerable power, it used to be greater, to inflame the coronavirus situation far beyond what the facts would warrant. Surgeon General, the risk is low to the average American. Oh, and he tweeted again. Crying Chuck Schumer said, you will pay the price for this. You won't know what hit you. That is far beyond simple rhetoric. That is a physical threat, or at least a threat that you better vote for us. Trouble ahead. And... The president has continued his early morning tweet storm with Elizabeth Pocahontas Warren single-handedly destroyed the Bernie Sanders campaign by stripping voters away from his count on Super T. He lost states he could easily would have won if she had dropped out three days earlier. The DNC is doing it to Bernie again. Will he ever get angry? Will you people ever get angry? Will you ever stand up for yourselves? Cut number 16. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. <laughs> you can act like a man! What's the matter with you? Is this how you turn down a Hollywood Pinocchio that uh, cries like a woman? <laughs> what can I do? What can I do? What is it? You can act like a man. Wait a minute. That's sexist. Just ask AOC at a rally in Ann Arbor for Bernie. Cut number two. Hello, Ann Arbor! today first of all we love you back we love you right back we want to start off today of course recognizing international women's day yay to all the powerful ladies and and uh gender non-conforming femmes out there we're here for you wait, 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 wait. thank you for changing the world thank you for changing the world gender non-conforming femmes i'm not even sure what that is What's a gender non-conforming femme? In the 80s. I, <laughs> hi, I'm Eddie of gender non-conforming femmes. Oh, this is K-Rock. <laughs> we're we're going we're gonna to be playing Pete's Pub a little later. <laughs> You're listening to Rodney on the Rock. <laughs> <laughs> Get a new album. <laughs> it's self-titled Gender Non-Conforming Femmes. And, and and listen to our his single. <laughs> I'm very confused about what's in my pants. 
So, wow. You know, Elizabeth Warren lost. And I blame the sexism of the Democrat Party. They are sexist, sexist, sexist. Cut number 15. They're not going to release the album because they have decided that the cover is sexist. Well, so what? Yes. But what's wrong with being sexy? I mean, there's no... Sexist. Sexist. Okay, listen, I'm... Okay, all right. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, as the president pointed out, um, it is a disaster on every level. Um, but, you know, the word on the street, probably K Street, Pennsylvania Avenue maybe, is that the, the, the sexism of America kept her from becoming president because she's super smart and super honest. And, of course, she'd be, you know, as a woman of color, uh, or at least one 1,024th of a color. Uh, maybe that would be a shade, technically. I'm not sure how that works. Um, she lost because of sexism. And whose sexism? Uh, well, the Democrat Party's sexism, of course. It's the Democrat Party that was voting in the Democrat primary. So if Democrats refuse to vote for her because she's a woman, aren't the Democrats sexist? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I kind of think so. Look, uh, as you know, I write a column in Town Hall every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and I wrote one on Elizabeth Warren, This uh, and it's out today, and you can get an ant styled, The Dems are right. Americans find annoying liberal women very, very annoying. And let me just give you the uh, uh, first paragraph. Mark your calendars, because today is the day... Town Hall senior columnist Kurt Schlichter agreed with Big Chief Warren and Scat Francisco Congress creature Nancy Pelosi. Yes, they are correct that Americans rejected sitting Bolshevik because she was a woman, specifically because she was a very, very annoying woman who, besides her tack, track record of tacky lies, was very, very annoying in a uniquely female way. Putting aside that she is the Bud Light of faculty lounge socialism, Americans had no desire to spend four years with some national librarian in the Oval Office pestering us about using our inside voices and demanding that we share the toys we bought with the kids who broke there. She comes across as really school marmy, and the fact is marms identify as female. Or uh, 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 gender non-conforming femmes. I think is the the term of art. Are these people crazy or is this kind of a performance art thing? I mean, do they just do this stuff? Gender non-conforming femmes. Now, AOC was speaking to a crowd of Bernie supporters in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and of course, the Hugh Hewitt program has, you know, is is anti-University of Michigan as I understand it. That ha I I guess that has to do with a sports thing, Dwayne. There's, there's, uh, yeah, that's a sports ball thing. There's a sports now, ball Hugh thing. actually got his law degree from the University of Michigan. What, what, did, did while he was there, was he in touch with any gender non-conforming femmes who apparently inhabit Ann Arbor? I don't believe so. I don't think he. I, I don't think so. It's you know what gets me is it's so specific. I'm a gender non-conforming femme. Could there be a gender non-conforming him? I guess. I don't know. I don't know how this stuff works. I'm just a normal person. There's like boys and there's girls and that's pretty much it. Um, gender non-conforming femme. I don't even know where to go with that. And I don't think most of America does. I think they hear this insanity and they're just, you know, they roll, they roll their eyes. They're completely alienated. And of course, Joe Biden to the extent he's still conscious, now accepts all this stuff and goes along with it because he thinks that's what he needs to win this primary. He's apparently going to win the Michigan primary. He's up by, uh, according to a Detroit Free Press poll that just got released uh, about a half hour ago, and we talked about in our previous segment, he's up by uh, 24 points over Bernie Sanders. Bernie and the Bernie bros seem to be going down in flames. Um and I, I agree with the president. I don't think Elizabeth Warren did him any favors. Staying in, in her vanity campaign, um, which 
you know, is finally reaching the terminus of her personal trail of tears was, um, wow. I mean, that's just a huge betrayal of her alleged progressive, you know, bona fides. Hardcore progressives that are Bernie people, yep. they will never forgive Elizabeth Warren for this, right? For, for the debate performance, which they will never forgive her for this. So she was kind of like an Indian giver on progressivism? She. What do you think the Democrats paid her off with? Beads? I'm just, I'm just saying. It's because she's a fake Indian. God, that, that's never going to get old to me. That is never, ever, ever going to get old to me. Hey, you know, actually, why... What was the purpose of Elizabeth Warren's campaign? She's social. Like I said, she's the Bud Light of faculty lounge socialism. Um, she's certainly less filling. I don't know about taste great. No, wait, that's regular light beer. In any case, what was her purpose? What was the lane for her? Because if you're going to go socialist, you might as well go full commie. And that's Bernie. And if you're going to be the kind of corporatist, go along, get along, establishment drone, you, you go with you go with Joe. Her lane was the gender plus Bernie the, uh, Bernie's ideology that can get elected. That was her lane. Yeah, I kind of think. Do, do, do you think she uh, appealed to the gender nonconforming femme constituency? I'm sure she thought she appealed to everybody. She didn't appeal to me. I found her very annoying. You know, I, I and my, my column on Town Hall, which is the Dems are right, Americans find annoying liberal women very annoying. What I point out is that she's annoying in a uniquely female way. She's got this condescending thing. She's like the divorced school teacher, you know, you had in fifth grade, and she kept pictures of cats on her desk and tried to get you to uh, celebrate Kwanzaa. She's just irritating in a uniquely female way. And men and women are equal, but they are not the same. Bill Clinton was annoying in a uniquely male way. Just uh, just look at his uh, anxiety relief activities with his intern. But her, Elizabeth Warren, she was angling to be America's first wife. This is Kurt Schlichter sitting in for the great Hugh Hewitt. We'll be right back with Matt Bentley. Thank you, Kurt, to undermine everyone. ReliefFactor.com, if you are in pain and you want out of pain, well, you need to talk to the people that get it done. Pete and Seth Talbot, the father-son owners of ReliefFactor.com. They tell me that sometimes whole families can be helped when one member of the family gets out of pain. That's why Pete and Seth created the three-week quick start, so you can find out if those people are you. For about a dollar a day, you can see if you can get out of pain, and after that, less than the cost of a cup of coffee a week to stay out of pain. The three-week quick start is is like a trial pack and it can be at your door in about two to three days let's face it getting older exercise even everyday living can create discomfort pain you don't order relief factor just for yourself order it for your wife your your husband your family your friends they miss the old you too a three-week quick start at relieffactor.com 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 or call 800-500-8384 800-500-8384 and whatever you do come right back for more of kurt schlichter filling in here on the hugh hewitt shop don't forget to sign up for The Universe. All of Hugh's broadcasts on demand, The After Show, which in my opinion is worth the price all by itself, Dwayne FM, and all sorts of bonus content. www.huniverse.com
And that music can mean only one thing here on the Hugh Hewitt Show with retired United States Army Colonel Kurt Schlichter guest hosting. It's one of my favorite guests, personal friend, United States Marine, author of amazing action novels, Matthew Betley. How you doing, Matt? Hey, Kurt. How you doing, brother? I'm doing good, but I'm a little worried about you. You are a veteran of Iraq. You are an activist for your fellow service members and veterans who suffered from burn pit injuries. That, that is correct, yeah. So, so with the uh, current uh, panic over the coronavirus, I'm a little concerned because, as you mentioned, uh, I sustained permanent uh, lung damage from my time in Iraq from 2006 to 2007. Uh, but in my case, I'm not totally freaking out, and the reason is is that I suffered upper respiratory airway damage, whereas the coronavirus and all the people that are dying, it's causing lower respiratory damage with pneumonia deep in, in the deep tissues of the lungs. So I'm hoping that, yes, if I get it, and, and you know, I've seen estimates that 30, 40 percent of the population will have it within so many months that, hey, I'm able to fight it off. Plus, you know, I'm really fit. I'm 48. Uh, otherwise, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. It is... Uh, you know, it's definitely an unfortunate situation, and we can all thank China for it. <laughs> Don't you know it's racist to call it the Wuhan flu? Well, I was just joking. I'm waiting for spicy Wuhan wings from Buffalo Wild Wings. Hey, actually, that sounds... Uh, yeah, d- does it come with uh, a bat or pangolin? Can you get <laughs> pangolin wings? Not. Wait a minute, I don't think sure. pangolins have wings. Bats have wings. Yeah, only if they want to uh, raise the ire of PETA. <laughs> Well, Matt, you are uh, besides an activist for uh, our injured vets, and I, I and, and thank you for that explanation because that was one of the things I was worried about uh, that, that that our guys who served overseas so bravely would be at uh, considerable risk of this disease based on the lung damage. Um, you are also a thriller writer. I am. I I, I currently have. Uh Four thrillers out from Simon & Schuster uh, follow the protagonist, Logan West, as he battles various uh, nefarious conspiracies and plots across the globe. Uh, You know, I I describe them as intense emotional geopolitical action thrillers. And then I also just finished writing my first standalone thriller, uh, The Details, which I'm keeping to myself. You know a few of them. And that's getting ready to get submitted to my agent. But what I will say is for the new book, and, and, you know, for all the listeners out there who haven't read any of my previous books, this is a standalone with all new characters intended to draw in new readers. And I basically take suburban America and take conventional norms on security and, and, and protection and turn them on their head. Well, this whole coronavirus thing, it, 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 it strikes me as if it could come out of a novel. This is a, a black a, a black swan event, though, albeit one that uh, we've been talking about for a long time. When you're coming up with your scenarios for your thrillers, how do, do you try and keep them plausible, or do you just let go? I, I keep mine plausible, especially the action sequences. I, I'd like people to read my books and go, wow, that could happen, but it probably won't happen. Uh, you know, I, I used to joke when I first started writing thrillers that if everything in a thriller happened, the world would have ended like a million times over uh, just because of all the books out there. Uh, you know, with, with the coronavirus, if I were writing a story about this, the, the fictional spin that I would take is that everyone in the world's already been infected by it, and something is actually activating and triggering it in certain people. That would be my take. And, you know, find out who the big bad is who, who's doing it to, to kill off a certain part of the, the world's demographic. But, of course, in reality, what we have is a, a natural event. These things do happen. And I think it's kind of interesting that uh, our friends, the Democrats, uh, aided and abetted by the news media, are attempting to put it at the feet of the Trump administration. And I am racking my brains trying to figure out the thing that Trump could have done that he hasn't done. And I just never see that. 
No, you know, the reality is we're doing everything realistically that we could have. We can at the time, and, you know, the, the extreme measures would have been at the first sign to immediately cease all international travel. Now, is that really going to happen? No, uh, of course not. At some point, if this thing blows up exponentially, could it? I, anything's possible, and I, and I could see that realistically. I mean, we've already cut off travel to all the really bad parts of, of the world that have crazy rates of this thing. But, you know, you know the irony is that th- these things happen, uh, and that nobody in the media is actually talking about how China handled it uh, in, in the initial weeks and months. Well, if, look, if you're you're someone who likes the idea of government health care, take a look at China, because that's all they got, government health care. Hey, that's uh, Matt Bentley, thriller writer. Check out all his books and stick around here with me, guest host Kurt Schlichter. On the Hugh Hewitt Radio Program. We'll be back next hour with Jenna Ellis. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by I Still Believe. Rated PG. Parental guidance suggested.
Morning Glory, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt, but I'm not there. I am on the beaches of Hawaii somewhere reading a Dickens novel with the fetching Mrs. Hewitt. The ideal vacation for a week before more madness of the Ohio primary. This week, though, sitting in for me Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Colonel Kurt Schlater. You've read all of his novels. You've read all of his nonfiction books. You read his townhall.com column. I am pleased to say, I think I discovered Kurt. Actually, he stormed the studio and said, I will be your guest host, and we weren't going to argue with this heavily armed. No, he's not heavily armed. We love Colonel Kurt. He did trick me into going to Kosovo for the best three days I've ever spent with the troops. And he's one heck of a radio show host. Welcome, Colonel Kurt. Thank you, Hugh Hewitt, for that, you know, that introduction. Gosh, if I, uh, if I wasn't a uh, cavalry officer and a Los Angeles trial lawyer, I would, uh, uh, I would let that go to my head. But fortunately, those, uh, those two things mean I'm uh, modest and never, ever won to have a hugely inflated ego. Okay, those are all lies. All damn lies. Anyway, let's get right to it. There's a lot of stuff happening. We've got the stock market is preparing to go way, 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 way down, and I think that's a temporary blip. Oil prices are coming down. That's actually a good thing. And coronavirus, well, the number of cases is increasing, but we're getting some good information that tells us that not everybody is at a huge risk. So we've got a lot going on. And I want to bring on Jenna Ellis. She's the senior legal advisor to Donald Trump 2020. And you can follow her at Jenna Ellis esque on Twitter. Jenna, how are you on this very busy morning? Good morning. It's always a great Monday. And uh, thanks so much for having me. Well, I, I'm glad to have you. I, before we get to some other stuff, because there's a lot of things we want to talk about. I want to talk to you about how Donald Trump is uh, confronting the news media about fake news, and he's doing it in kind of a uniquely legal way. Yeah, the, uh, the the Trump campaign has now filed three lawsuits against the New York Times, the Washington Post, and CNN for false statements that they published, and uh, we're suing them for those false statements. And unfortunately, you know, the fake news has, has always had this uh, overarching bias against uh, Donald Trump and the campaign. And we and we know that. And um, and that's unfortunate. And, um, you know, we're we're certainly happy to uh, confront anyone's opinions, of course, and that's part of freedom of the press. But what's not part of protected uh, speech is actually knowingly false and defamatory statements. And that's what these three outlets have done. And so we are suing them because they have refused to retract those statements. And uh, in particular, CNN was the last suit that we just filed last week. And it, uh, there was an article that they claimed, and they actually published, that the campaign, quote, assessed the potential risks and benefits of, again, seeking Russia's help in 2020 and has decided to leave that option on the table, unquote. Well, that's absolutely false. CNN knew it was false at the time of publication, yet they published it anyway and misled their readers. And uh, we, in fact, actually asked them to retract. They refused. So we were left with no alternative but to file a lawsuit. Defamation is one of the hardest causes of action to win. I've uh, I won a multi-million dollar defamation verdict for a plaintiff. I defended Ben Shapiro successfully when Clockboy sued him over allegedly defamatory statements that were, of course, nothing of the kind. Uh, how do you? Uh, what's the venue? That is, what court are you in? And how do you see this litigation going? Well, we have a really great lead attorney. Uh, Charles Harder is actually the lead attorney, and he's an expert in this area. Um, he's, in fact, the one who successfully sued uh, Gawker. For he's a Los Angeles Gawker. guy. Yeah, and uh, and also represented our wonderful first lady, Melania Trump, and won uh, a a suit um, for her that was, uh, you know, false and defamatory statements from another publication. So, you know, he's, this isn't his first rodeo. He's uh, been around the block. He knows what he's doing. And uh, we're very confident that these three suits uh, will be successful. And the venues, of course, are different because the publications are different. Um, and so there's uh, the federal district courts in uh, New York, uh, D.C., and Georgia are the specific venues. And you can find the complaints online. Definitely follow uh, team Trump at Team Trump on Twitter, 
and you can find uh, all of those complaints if you're a lawyer and you're you know nerds like us who <laughs> like to actually read these complaints. I only read time. if I'm billing. Yeah, you know, I got to be billing, otherwise I'm not doing a law. <laughs> After 25 years, it stopped well, being fun. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> that's sad. You got to, you got to, you got to go back and love it. I'm sure you've read at least the complaints. These are only a couple pages. They're actually worthwhile. <laughs> I, I think they probably are, and it's uh, it's always interesting uh, as a lawyer to uh, uh, talk to uh, non-lawyers about defamation law and. People don't understand. It's a very hard cause of action to win, as it should be, but it is possible to win it. Is Now, here's the thing. Is this a way we want to go? That is, do we want uh, to be confronting the news media, not just by telling the truth, which the president does on Twitter, but are, do you have any concerns about using the legal system uh, to address media malpractice? Not at all. In fact, that's precisely what this specific uh, defamation law is there for. When the fake news media has uh, been so severely harmful uh, and they have so misled their readers and they have acted with actual malice, which, of course, is the legal standard against a public figure, which the campaign is. Yes. And, of course, this is the campaign, not the president, by the way. Uh, that's a very important distinction. It's the campaign that's filing these suits. Uh, this isn't going to have a chilling effect on the freedom of the press or on the fifth, uh, I'm sorry, the First Amendment. I mean, this isn't you know this isn't anything that we're going after anyone's opinion or protected speech. This is precisely what the law is there for to make sure that you can't publish knowingly false statements that intentionally target. Uh, the campaign or any type of public figure. That's not protected speech. That's why the law is there. And, you know, if if a side benefit of this is that the news media actually acts with uh, fairness and acts with uh, truthiness, as Ben Shapiro would say, uh, that's, <laughs> that's a really good thing. So, um, so we, but, you know, but this is, this is something that we filed the lawsuit because uh, we want to publicly establish the truth. We want to properly inform readers and the rest of the world of the true facts and also seek appropriate remedies for the harm cause. And we've been left with no alternative but to file these suits. And again, that's exactly why petitioning the government for redress of grievances is also a protected constitutional right uh, in, in our law. Right now, Donald Trump is being accused in the media and by other politicians, directly and indirectly, of being responsible for the spread of the coronavirus. It's irresponsible and it's kind of dumb. Do you see any kind of legal remedy for that? Or is this just part of debate and should be handled as debate? Well, I mean, of course, that is completely fake. And there are some people that are going to more extreme than... Uh, than others by actually blaming him for uh, the start of the virus or the spread of the virus. I mean, it's just, it's, it's completely ridiculous. And, um, and you know, that's, that's something that's a great question. And I think uh, those, those things have to, of course, be carefully uh, analyzed. But what we can do is definitely continue to, uh, to tell the truth. And the campaign will continue to do that. The administration has done that incredibly well. Um, Vice President Mike Pence, uh, Secretary Azar, the president himself, uh, they have been very, very much on top of this. Uh, they continue um, to to share the truth. And, you know, it's, it's the responsibility of the media. We can debate all day whether or not we uh, like the administration, whether or not we're going to vote for Trump. All of those things are perfectly debatable issues. But the fake news media should not spread intentionally false information and they should not use the coronavirus issue to spread fear or panic just in order to politicize the issue. Uh, that's something that's actually irresponsible and it's frankly uh, detrimental to um, the health, safety, and welfare of the American people. I think you're absolutely right, Jen Ellis, uh, Senior Legal Advisor to Trump 2020. And I, I tend to agree with you that the, the proper response to this political nonsense is more debate. We've seen the president jump on Twitter today, going directly to the American people. Um, 
one last question. We only have about 30 seconds. How do you see this election playing out? Oh, President Trump is definitely winning in a landslide. Uh, We all have to come out and vote, though. Make sure that you get out and vote. But you can see the love at the rallies. You can see how many people have turned out in primaries that are uncontested for this incumbent uh, president. And well, so that, it's, it's absolutely amazing. He's going to win. We're very confident. In thank you, Jen Ellis. This is Kurt Schlichter. Stick around. we got a lot more on the Hugh Hewitt program. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you by Food for the Poor.
This is Kurt Schlichter, guest hosting for Hugh Hewitt on the Hugh Hewitt radio program, live from the Relief Factor studio in beautiful Southern California at O Dark 30. I am woman, hear me roar, hear Elizabeth Warren roar with her war cry. Um, wow, she's just terrible, isn't she? She's just the worst. There was sexism that, there was sexism that, that, that stopped me. The sexism of the Democrat Party. Yeah. Wow. That's not good. That's not good at all. And the Democrat Party is open to all sorts of women. Can you give me cut number two? Yeah. Hello, Ann Arbor! It's AOC! What's good, Michigan? At a Bernie rally! Are we ready to nominate and be on the road to nominate Bernie Sanders for president this Tuesday? I want to start off today, first of all, we love you back. We love you right back. Ugh. We want to start off today, of course, recognizing International Women's Day. To all the powerful ladies and, and uh, gender non-conforming femmes out there, we're here for you. Oh, my Thank gosh. Thank you for changing the world. Yeah, gender non-conforming femmes, my favorite 80s band. I used to listen to them on K-Rock a lot. Gender non-conforming Thems. You know, it's got to be hard to be a Democrat because you've got to keep track of all this insanity. Let's say I got to remember women, gender nonconforming thems, other gender nonconforming type people, other types of thems. Um, it's it's exhausting. It's just exhausting trying to keep up with this. Do you think do you think Joe Biden's up to it? Do you think Joe Biden can manage to uh uh, keep track of all the little genders and identities and things that he's got to keep track of. He can't even keep track of who he wants to win the election. That's true. Cut nine. Because we cannot get reelect. We cannot win this reelection. Excuse me. We can only reelect Donald Trump. I, I built Joe Biden, I think. He can't keep track of, you know, the, the thing. The thing. The thing. Bring me up, Adam. I'm created by the, go, you know the, you know the thing. I don't think he knows the thing. I don't think he knows the thing. And I, I, I just don't see him, I just don't see him holding on. I just don't see him making it. And if he does, what he wants to do is return us to, to frankly, kind of a nightmare. Um, and on that subject, Donald Trump has tweeted. Trump tweeted, the Obama-Biden administration is the most corrupt administration in the history of our country! Exclamation point! The president is right! It was the most corrupt, and it was not just corrupt in the sense of petty graft. It was corrupt in the way that it sold out so many Americans by its embrace of false globalism, by its refusal to end wars that we refuse to win, by its total abandonment of basic principles in order to cater to the kind of people who use phrases like gender nonconforming femmes with a straight face. I, I, you know, I, I, I use it ironically. I will use it ironically. But this is nonsense. And I don't think America wants to go back to it. Wh 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 who out there is saying, you know what? You know what we need? Unemployment. The Chinese running rampant over us trade-wise. We need all this stuff. We don't need any of that stuff. What we need is in our four years of President Trump. This is Kurt Schlichter, guest hosting for the great Hugh Hewitt. Stick around.
Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show brought to you by Sierra Pacific Mortgage. For more info, call 888-888-1172.
We're back. Back on the Hugh Hewitt radio program. Lil, you, you can tell that me, Kurt Schlichter, is uh, subbing for Hugh Hewitt because, frankly, the bumper music is about a thousand times better. That, of course, is the um, Gender Nonconforming Femmes, a famous 80s band uh, playing Blister on the Sun for your musical edification. Um, would you like to win the House of Representatives back in November? I certainly would, and I think it can happen. And if it happens, it's going to happen in places like California's 25th Congressional District. And that, that now you may remember that. That's the one that had Katie Hill. Remember the thruple girl, the one who was, you know, naked on the hotel furniture in the picture? It's just gross, and she's just a gross person. And it used to be a Republican seat. She took it from Steve Knight. We're going to take it back, and we're going to take it back with Mike Garcia, Navy fighter pilot and candidate in the 25th District. Mike, how are you this morning? Hey, good morning, Kurt. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing very, very well, not the least of which because I think your seat stands a very, very good chance of coming back to the Republican hands. Absolutely. What do you think? Absolutely, yeah. We've been, uh, you know, we've been in this race against Katie Hill originally for almost a year now, and uh, gone through seventeen opponents, and uh, we're down to one, and, and the math is finally on our side now with a great Republican turnout on Tuesday uh, last week, and uh, when you add it all up, we've got a we've got a very good advantage and a unique opportunity here. Well, in fact, between you and Steve Knight, who was uh, who formerly occupied the seat and lost to Katie Hill, you guys came up with uh, in the high forties. Yeah, just between he and I, there was uh, close to uh, 48, 49 percent, and then uh, we had, you know, a, a good four or five other Republicans uh, with one or two percent each. So uh, all said and done, we had about a five-point delta between the Republicans and Dems, and, uh, uh, you know, we really need to unite the clans, as they say, and, and, and bring it all in for the, the special election on May 12th. But uh, Steve Knight is, uh, has been a good supporter uh, since uh, since the election there, and has uh, officially endorsed. So we uh, we're in good shape. We should be able to off and, and and get the votes consolidated and, and be able to uh, win the runoff on May twelfth. Now you weren't the insider establishment candidate. You are coming in from the outside, and you won your place on the ballot uh, by tireless campaigning. How is the establishment treating you? Uh, good. You know, I think uh, it, it, the, the hard work has paid off. Everyone has recognized that, uh, you know, from a fundraising perspective, uh, I was in the lead from an infrastructure and manpower. Uh, I was in the lead here and uh, with 400 volunteers, and that's really what made the difference was our, was our team and our volunteers. It was a true grassroots campaign, and uh, that, that paid off in spades, frankly. And uh, uh, the parties recognized it, and uh, you know, there's no hard feelings. There's no uh, there's no resentment uh, from either side, and uh, now we all realize we've got to back the right uh, candidate and, and make sure we get this one across the goal line. So, looking forward to it. Republicans are coming together. How how can people help you? Uh, the biggest thing we can use right now, honestly, is funds. Uh, if you're in the district, get the word out and 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 volunteer and vote. Uh, but if you're outside of the district, which is Northern LA County. Uh, we we need money desperately. We're going to be going against a large Democrat machine here, and uh, they're going to bear down on us uh, within the next couple weeks. So uh, they can visit uh, electmikegarcia.com. That's electmikegarcia.com and make a contribution right there. We'll be putting the money to good use and uh, getting the seat back. And this will be the first one in the red shock wave uh, for 2020 that we actually do get back. Now, you are a businessman and a Navy fighter pilot, F-18s, if I remember correctly. I won't hold the fact that you're an aviator against you. But uh, what, what, tell, tell me about your opponent. Who is she, and where does she come from? Yeah, Christy Smith is a, is a local here uh, in Santa Clarita Valley. She, was, uh, she, she is our assemblywoman in Sacramento, uh, and she's been in the position for just over a year. Uh, and to be honest, she is she is the problem in California right now. There there isn't a bill in in Sacramento that uh, uh, came with a tax that she didn't pass. Uh, she supported AB five oh. uh, when, the, when the vote to revoke AB five came across her desk. She re, she uh, voted no on that. Uh, so she's a, a proponent of AB five. She's a proponent of every tax bill we've seen here in the last year. And uh, you know the, quinti the the quintessential piece of this to me is uh, the, the fact that within the California budget they're giving ninety eight million dollars 
to support free health care for illegal immigrants age 19 to 25. Uh, and this is why we have all the homeless problems. This is why we have uh, challenges with our veterans and our seniors. Uh, and she represents at the core the problems that we're having in Sacramento. So uh, it's a real, uh, you know, it, it's a real problem to be uploading that to the national level. And I, frankly, I just don't want my my country to turn into what the government of California has become. And she's at the core of the problem right now. Well, for those who don't know, AB5 is a particularly vicious bill that's disenfranchised and and made thousands and thousands of Americans in California unable to work. It basically outlaws being an independent contractor and all the flexibility uh, that goes along with it. The idea is to create employees, which creates the ability to unionize, which creates more money for the Democrats. I take it you're against AB5 and the... And the uh, PRO Act, which is the national version that the Democrats want to pass. That's correct. Yeah, I'm against all of that. Obviously, it's, a, it's clearly a play for the unions, uh, which he's in the pocket of. Um, and, and we've got to stop it here. So uh, California usually leads, leads the nation on, on things like this, and it's a harbinger of things to come at the national level. Oh, it's a terrible, terrible thing. How you're a military guy? Tell us about your strategy to win back the 25th district in California. It's going to be what it's been all along. You know, I, it, we, we can't take anything for granted. I'm out there uh, making every meeting, going to every event. We're raising money. Uh, we're we're knocking on doors. We're being extremely aggressive on the ground game. And uh, you know, I want to just make it rain longer than she can tread water. And we're gonna we're gonna, we need to keep raising money and keep getting the vote out here. And as as long as we had uh, the voter turnout on Tuesday of last week that we have, or, or as long as we pull that off on May twelfth again, uh, we should be in great shape. But we've got to be aggressive. A lot of people running for Congress on the Republican side uh, in twenty sixteen and twenty eighteen purposely distanced themselves from the president. Do you distance yourself from President Trump? I, I do not. Nope. Uh, n- not at all. I'm a, I'm a supporter of this president. I'm not ashamed of it. Uh, you know, I use the metaphor. He's, he's an 800-horsepower engine, and, and right now he's got a 100-horsepower transmission bolted to him in the form of this Congress. So uh, we've got to take this House back to fully enable him and uh, allow him to fully realize the opportunities for this country. Uh, he will win this election. He'll get another four years. And, uh, you know, I think any Republican who's distance, distancing themselves from him right now is is making an, a mistake, and uh, in our district especially, his favorability rating is about 50-50, uh, and amongst Republicans, obviously, it's extremely high, so uh, we welcome the opportunity to have any visits here from the president, and, uh, you know, I, we, we need his support here, and, and frankly, his support is uh, strong here for him, so uh, I'm leveraging that. So as a military guy, what is your strategy for winning back the 25th district seat? Well, like I said, we're, we've just got to be aggressive. We've got to consolidate the base. Uh, we've got to make sure that everyone recognizes that this is effectively the, the equivalent of a political uh, Gettysburg for us. And it starts in our district. And, and once we win this seat back, we'll win seats around us. We'll win the lower level seats with the state assembly, state senate. And uh, that'll start rippling across not only California, but hopefully the nation. So getting people to realize the criticality of this election. Uh, getting engaged and, and uh, frankly, getting the churches involved and evangelicals involved, and, and that will make a huge difference uh, in our district especially. But uh, I think there's a renaissance on our hands here amongst the Republican Party. Now, Mike Garcia, let's let's get personal for a second. Yeah, like I said, you were a Navy fighter pilot. But have you always wanted to be in politics? Why are you doing what you're doing now, and how would you get there? No, you know, I was, I was a graduate of uh, Annapolis and uh, went to grad school. I won't hold that against you either. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Uh, I appreciate that, Kurt. Thanks. Um, uh, and uh, Georgetown University for grad school and national security. It keeps getting worse and worse. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sorry. Uh, but but I, I've always had an interest in politics, but no, no real desire to become a politician or serve uh, as a career. Uh, frankly, was watching Katie Hill run for office, watching her win, and uh, watching our nation starting to go in a direction with this freshman house uh, that, that repulsed me, frankly, and I couldn't sit on the sidelines and, and be okay with it. Uh, as a father of two, you know, I've got a 13-year-old and a 3-year-old, and, and the prospect of, of, of this freshman house uh, making decisions over the course of the next uh, uh, several administrations uh, or several terms just 
frankly scared the hell out of me. So uh, decided to quit my job at uh, Raytheon. Had a great uh, position there at Raytheon as an executive and uh, do something about it. And it's been it's been a, a hell of a ride, but it's been worth it. And we will get this one back. Well, the Hugh Hewitt show is a uh, very, very pro Navy show, and they, they somehow like. I, I guess I'm here for diversity. Yeah, you're the token. token. I'm, the, I'm the token soldier. Um, one of the big issues is getting our Navy back to the shape it should be, and that is in quantity and quality. Uh, we're big supporters of the 355 ship Navy. Do you uh, envision yourself as seeking a seat on uh, uh, the Armed Services uh, Committee? And what what kind of ideas do you have about American national defense, Mike Garcia? Yeah, absolutely. I think being on the House Armed Service Committee is critical for this district. Uh, this is a, a district that's got an economy underpinned by the aerospace business with uh, big big primes like Northrop and Lockheed in, in our Antelope Valley, and that all trickles down into the, the other areas of the district. So I uh, would love to be on the HASC. Uh, for me, as far as uh, the military, it's not just the Navy. It's, it's all services, even the Army. Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, that seven hundred and fifty billion dollar mark is absolutely critical. This president's done a nice job of investing in the military on the heels of the Obama administration that was frankly uh neglect in, in, in investing in readiness and modernizing uh technology. Well so thank we thank you very much, Mike Garcia. Go help him. Do what you can. Let's take that seat back. This is Kurt Schlichter, guest hosting for Hugh Hewitt. Thank you, Kurt, to undermine everyone, andrewandtodd.com, andrewandtodd.com. They are lenders with Sierra Pacific Mortgage, 888 I don't know if they've done Kurt's house or not, but they should. Kurt, you ought to call up Andrew and Todd at 888 No matter where you are, the interest rates have been driven down so low by the coronavirus that you need to check into whether or not you have need to refinance. And even if you've done it in the last six months or three months, you've got to check again. Andrew Del Rey, Todd Abakey, and her friends of mine, and have been for years, you can trust them. It's the most important portion of any consultation with a mortgage lender. 888 1172 or best, go online to andrewandtodd.com, andrewandtodd.com. Answer a couple of quick questions. I'll be right back to you. Don't forget as well, Honorbound Coffee, honorboundcoffee.com. Colonel Kurt will love this. Honorboundcoffee.com dedicates 100% of their profits to serve the families of the military deployed overseas. 100% of every sip of coffee you take will be profiting those men and women who are protecting this country's freedom, as Colonel Kurt did for 20-plus years. Don't forget to get two bags for the price of one as their starting offer. And then, of course, relieffactor.com, made by the same people who make Honorbound Coffee, but this one is for profit. Uh, this one is for their benefit, but Pete and Seth Talbot have done such a great product that people buy it and buy it and buy it. We're up to tens of thousands of people every morning doing what I do, take it. I'm on vacation. I took it with me. It goes everywhere with me, especially if there's an overhead baggage compartment involved. And I have not regretted one day becoming a relieffactor.com user and I know you're going to join me in saying that is amazing stuff. It's made my life easier. It will make your life easier. Which is why tens of thousands of people have joined me in getting the starter pack, 1995 for a three week trial and then seeing if it works. And it usually does. On bad backs, on bad knees, on bad necks, whatever comes from exercise, aging, or long commutes, Relief Factor is for you. relieffactor.com, relieffactor.com. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by I Still Believe, rated PG, parental guidance suggested.
This is Kurt Schlichter, and I will dare to play incredibly good bumper music as I guest host here in this last segment of the Hugh Hewitt radio program for today. Have no fear. I will be back Tuesday and Wednesday of this week while Hugh Hewitt is off in Hawaii. You will get more replacements. Not, 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 not replacement substitute hosts. Replacements bumper music. The greatest band ever. Much better than Tom Petty. That's for you, Dwayne. Okay, let's get. Oh, he's 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 belling up to the mic. He's going to say something obnoxious. I'm I'm here. I'm about to. They're re- not even the greatest band you've played today. Oh my gosh! Everything you say is wrong. Now, now just stop. Let me help people. I want to help people. Let me remind you about Hughes' spring campaign to rush food and clean drinking water to starving kids in Guatemala through our friends at Food for the Poor. Less than half of all kids in rural Guatemala have access to clean, safe drinking water, and most of them go hungry on a daily basis. But they're warm and welcoming to visitors, as Nashville High School junior Natalie Anderson found out on a recent mission with Food for the Poor. I was actually pretty nervous. I might not be able to connect with the children because of the language barrier. But the second family we met, I just fell in love with this little girl named Camila. She placed two of her very own stickers on my hands. And it just struck me because even in her own despair and desperation and not having anything at all, she was still giving something to me. I just feel like we can take something from that and even in our abundance. If she can give her two little stickers to me, we can give back to their community. As Natalie says, we can give back. Please, right now, just go to HughHewitt.com, hit the banner at the top, or call 855-359-4673. That's 855-359-HOPE. $80 provides a hungry child with food for a year and for life. Thank you very much for helping us feed starving families through our friends at Food for the Poor. Well, look, the market's market's going to open way down because of combination of coronavirus and uh, the... Uh, collapse in prices of oil which actually isn't quite that bad a thing it's it's going to start low you've gotta you gotta stay steady you gotta not panic you gotta be realistic things are going to get better and you've got so much to look forward to here's something i'm looking forward to cut number 13 the media and you know where i'm going on this one right guys the media would be on TV. Every telepsychologist would say, Donald Trump has lost his mind. Donald, it, he's in the later stages of dementia and a combination of Alzheimer's. He's not fit to run. Joe Biden doesn't know what state he's in 50% of the time. If Donald Trump did the equivalent, you would not hear anything other than that. Donald How much Trump. will his son be a part of that, Hunter? There's obviously been a big... Listen, I, I think it's got to be a big part. I was an international business person before my father got into politics. That's what we did. I'm not going to say I haven't benefited from my father's last name, just like Hunter Biden did. I'd be foolish to say that. But I haven't benefited from my father's taxpayer-funded office. Okay? Hunter Biden, his father becomes VP. All of a sudden, he goes over to the Ukraine. And he's making 83 grand a month. So, you know, the media likes to do this sort of false equivalence. You, you're doing this, you're doing that. We stopped doing any new international business deals when my father won the presidency. So, you know what would be great? I'll let you host it. You moderate a debate between Hunter Biden and myself. Come on. Let's do it. No, no. Seriously. We, we can go full, full transparency. We show everything. And we can talk about all of the places where I'm supposedly grifting but Hunter Biden isn't. Wait, I would, would love like to the, do it. The great who made more off dad debate? No, no, no. It talk about, it, hey, as it relates to the grift, they're saying yeah. we're profiting off of the presidency. But you Let's profit, talk about don't it. you? I, ha- I don't know that I've profited you off the a, presidency. You we have a selling book. You do paid speeches. You, don't I, you I've done paid a, speeches for over a decade. I do a lot. I don't even do well, the international ones you anymore. You make some money off it, right? You're, you're, Nothing you're that I haven't done before. And again, if you looked at my tax returns, right. which maybe we could talk about in this debate. So you'll release show me, your tax returns. You would release your tax returns if you would debate you. You'd really debate them? I 100% debate them. Let's talk about who profited off of whose public service. Happy to do it. Let's make it happen. I, I love that idea. 
I love the idea of a debate between Don Jr. and Hoover uh, Hunter Biden. I'm uh, I'm I'm just saying. Hunter, you know, Hunter, the nice thing about him is he comes with a ring girl already, so she can walk around with a little uh, round card, you know, and then maybe bear him a child. Um, How do you know what that is? Isn't that sports ball? What, punching people? Yeah, isn't that, isn't that a sport? It's isn't a, that a sports ball? A, 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 isn't it the sweet science? You actually like boxing? No. That's a sport no, you like? I don't like boxing. I don't like any sports. I care nothing for sports, and I will continue caring nothing for sports as I guest host the Hugh Hewitt Show Tuesday and Wednesday of this week as well. Hugh Hewitt is off in Hawaii, but I'll be back. I bet you we'll talk about the stock market and coronavirus and all sorts of great stuff. See you tomorrow.